just breathe. Come and rest at my feet. But all you need is Is to breathe Just breathe Come and rest At my feet Take that in and breathe. Just take a deep breath. It's so good, once again, to be together. It's so good that we get to come in these spaces together and breathe. That even when we're far apart physically, in the spirit, we're together. So let's breathe together in this moment. I don't know how your week was, but I invite you to breathe in the breath of God and breathe out whatever burdens you're carrying, even if just for this moment. Oh, how we need to breathe. I don't know about you, but I especially need to breathe when I'm behind the mask. Sometimes you just feel like you can't get that breath. And I know there are those that are feeling that way right now that you just can't even catch a breath. So let's breathe.
We want to welcome you this morning. I'm Pastor Tracy. I'm the pastor of Cornerstone Christian Fellowship, and our purpose statement here is loving God and loving others fearlessly. And uh, we, are, we are working at doing that. And it's not an easy road, but that's our heart, is to love God and love others fearlessly. Julian of Norwich says this, first we must fall, and then after we fall, we get up, and both are the mercy of God. We are at a time in our world, in our nation, that a lot of things are crumbling. A lot of things are being revealed. First, we must fall. And then, after we fall, we get up. I believe that we're in a time when we'll eventually, we are gonna see beauty from ashes. I believe that we're in a time that though things are crumbling, things will rise again. But this time, they're gonna rise equal. Amen. This time, they're gonna rise with justice for all. All meaning all. So this morning, as we come into this time, there's all kinds of different falling. What I'm inviting us into this morning is falling back into God's arms. Mm -hmm. It's to fall back into God's arms through worship, fall back into God's arms as we hear the word, which is such a special word and such a timely word from Terry, and fall back into God's arms through communion that we're going to be taking. So though things might fall, they must fall. But when they fall, they will get back up and both are the mercy of God. Let's worship together, church.
loved ones that we all have that are out there and that we think like they're beyond God. We think they're maybe hopeless. We see situations that we go, you know, they're so far gone that, that does God still chase them? The answer is yes. The answer is that there is no wall that's big enough that God doesn't kick down. There's no lie that's strong enough that God is not stronger still. There is nothing. Our, our loved ones cannot run so far that they're too far from God's hand. Every morning, every day, every new day that our loved ones wake up, God says, I am here and I am chasing. So this morning, trust that God is chasing down your loved ones, our loved ones, my loved ones. I got them too. Every day, God's very nature cries out his glory and his love for us. Every day, God's arms are stretched out wide and he's running after us. He's running up walls, down walls. He's running through valleys, up valleys. He's running up mountains, down mountains. He's tearing down lies. God never stops chasing us. God never stops chasing our loved ones. So let's sing that chorus again. And while you're singing it, think of your loved ones and go, God, even them, even them, God, you are chasing down no one. No one is too far out of his grasp. Let's keep worshiping. There's no shadow you won't light up. Mountain you won't climb up. Coming after me. Those I love, Lord, today. There's no wall you won't kick down. Lie you won't tear down.
Every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realms has already been lavished upon us through Christ. Just take a minute now. Call your loved one's names out. Call them out. If they just happen to be sitting next to you, just think it in your head. God hears it. Just call out their names. Lord, you know every one of our names. You know every name that is being spoken even right now. You have overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love. Your love lavished, is lavished upon us. Your love lavishes upon the one that is out there, just one that's out there lost, and you go, gotta go, gotta find them, just one. Lord, I thank you for our ones in our lives. I thank you. I thank you that you're chasing them down even now. I thank you that you are calling their names even now that they would know you, that they would see you, that they would know that they are complete in you and that you lavish your love upon them right where they are, warts and all, right where they are. Thank you so much for that, Lord. Thank you for your faithfulness in their lives. We do not have to be afraid because you are faithful and you love them a kajillion, jillion, jillion times more than we ever could. So much so that you died for them. So, Lord, pour out love on our loved ones, Lord, whose names we're calling out. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Just want to continue to invite you to give at this time. You know, God lavishes upon us so much. And this is one way that we get to lavish back upon God and say we trust you. Even in these times, Lord, we will trust you. So we invite you to give at this time. We thank you, thank you, thank you for your continued generosity in giving. It is so sweet. We just thank you that though we're apart, you continue to pour into this community. And we have so many things, especially that are coming up in this time that we're gonna be implementing. So we thank you for that, for your generous giving. We also just want to um, remind everybody of our Tuesday night Zoom meetings that right now we are um, continuing a discussion on racism, continuing a discussion on, on how we come together, what God might be calling us into. We're a diverse community, and we want the beauty of this community to go out into the world, but we also want our own eyes to continue to be open. So lots of good conversations going on on Zoom. Janice and James Beatty are, are uh, co-leading that with me moderating it, I guess. So we invite you to that as well. And um, today we have one of our elders, Reverend Terry Moss, coming up to share with us. I'm so excited. You know, this is one of those moments that God does a thing. You know, we didn't know what was going on in the world and we as an elder team just said, let's do parables. And it just so happens that the first parable that we chose, and by the way, it wasn't here, it wasn't on the first one at first, it was like number five, and then we're playing around with the schedule for various reasons, and then it ended up here. And uh, it's about the 99, and the one that goes away. God's timing is brilliant. Because, well, God is brilliant. <laughs> kind of, it's normal there. So, uh, we're gonna invite Terry to come on up, and, and uh, share with us, and just so excited today to hear from her. So, Terry. Good morning, church family. Uh, it's a blessing to be with you this morning. And um, I'm very thankful for each one of you. And I realize that even more as we've been apart during this time. Um, 
I miss you all very much. So, we've spent nearly the last year learning together from Matthew 5 through 8, which is Jesus' Sermon on the Mount about the upside down kingdom. And, and we talked about how the ways, the ways of God's reign and God's kingdom are upside down from the ways of the, this world's systems. And now we've come to the end of that passage and I have to tell you it was transformative for me, maybe for you too. I think one of the main things that I will remember from that study is that God will always fill those who are empty. And that coming to God emptied is the path to fulfillment for us as humans. Um, the other thing that stands out to me is that God's way is always, always, always the way of love. Toward our neighbor, toward our enemy, toward our brother and our sister. And I also, the, the, the one last thing I'll mention, there are many, I'm sure, for you as well. Um, but I, it also stands out to me that blessing doesn't always look like the world thinks it looks like. And so um, if you want, go ahead and put in the comments right now you know, what stands out to you as you think back on everything that we learned from the Sermon on the Mount, from the Upside Down Kingdom series. So thank you, fellow preachers and Pastor Tracy for leading the way as we spent time with Jesus's words. It always challenged and encouraged me. And so now this morning, like Pastor Tracy said, we're beginning a new sermon series. We're going to continue to study Jesus's words. And we're going to focus on the stories that he told when he taught. And they're called parables. A parable is a special name for a short fictional story that is meant to illustrate a point of teaching. And Jesus used this style of teaching a lot. Uh, we can see it all through all four of the Gospels. A parable is a pretty cool style of teaching. Um, and this is why I think so. Parables don't just give us the answer. They ask us to think about it. Have you ever noticed that teachers don't really like to just give you all the answers? I'm like that in my piano teaching. I love to take my students on a treasure hunt and uh, help them find clues along the way until they arrive at the answer for themselves. I mean, if they're totally going in the wrong direction, I will probably <laughs> guide them. <laughs> and if they're totally not seeing it at all, I might just tell them the answer. Uh, but my favorite is when they find it for themselves. And I'm pretty sure this is a teacher thing, and I know it's a little annoying. <laughs> um, but Jesus was, among so many other things, the best teacher. So he told parables all the time. Parables make us think and they do that by telling a story that is not directly the same topic as the issue at hand. But the story runs in a parallel way with the original issue, and it, it lets you think about it indirectly. I think it, it gives us a chance to think more creatively, like letting us think outside the box about the original issue. The word parable comes from the Greek word parabole. <laughs> I just wanted you to know that. And, and that's like two words, two Greek words put together. Para means close beside, like right alongside. And balo means to cast or to throw. It's like ball, like you throw it. And so when we put those two words together, it's like to throw something out there right alongside 
the issue at hand. So a parable, the word parable, it came to, to mean this style of teaching where these stories come right alongside the lesson to be learned. So, you ready to get into it? Yeah. All right. <laughs> the, whew, okay. Um, the first parable that we're going to look at, like Pastor Tracy said, it's from Luke 15. Um, so if you want to grab your Bible, if you, if you want to open that up to Luke 15, um, it's called the parable of the lost sheep. So I'm going to start out by just reading this passage of scripture. It's Luke 15, 1 through 7. And I'm reading from the NIV. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were muttering, this man welcomes sinners and eats with them. And then Jesus told them this parable. He said, suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Doesn't he leave the 99 in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And then he calls his friends and neighbors together and he says, rejoice with me. I have found my lost sheep. And then Jesus said, I tell you, in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who did not need to repent. It's so good. I feel like Jesus could have just gone boom and left it at that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but we don't drop mics. So that's not good. <laughs> that was for all my sound technicians. <laughs> um, but the rest of the chapter in Luke 15 actually goes on, and Jesus tells two more parables about lost things. We're going to get into that, like, next week and the week after. But this week, we're only talking about the lost sheep. You know, we... <sighs> We have to notice the setting carefully because that gives us context for what Jesus is saying with this parable. The tax collectors and sinners were all gathering around to hear Jesus. The Gospels tell us that Jesus always did this. He always welcomed the people who his society thought the least of. Aww. Dishonest tax collectors and notorious sinners is what the Passion Translation says. These were like the scum of the earth in Jesus' time. These tax collectors, uh, they were collecting on behalf of the Roman occupation in Judea which was already terrible, like having to pay the overlords who conquered and are oppressing your land. But then the tax collectors, who by the way were mostly Jewish, just like the people who lived in Judea, just like the people they were collecting from, they would overcharge. So they had a cut of the money that they were collecting. Some of them overcharged a lot. They were taking advantage of their own people, their own kinfolk, adding their weight to the already heavy oppression of the Roman occupation. These were not good people. They, they really had lived in a way that didn't take care of others, and even their own. And yet, Jesus always welcomed them. He ate meals with them, and he treated them like people. And the Pharisees and the teachers of the law didn't like it. Which honestly, is sort of understandable. But they constantly would criticize Jesus. And, and they would be like, what does this Jesus guy think he's doing? Like, doesn't he have, have any standards for who he hangs out with? who he welcomes, he's having dinner with them, for God's sake, right? Like, 
This is their attitude. And so Jesus, with this story, is responding to their discomfort and, and their accusation. And so he tells them this story. He says, just imagine, you have a hundred sheep. And one day, you realize one of them has gotten lost. So you go looking for the lost one, right? You leave the other ones that aren't lost right where they are, and you go and search for the one that's lost until you find it. And then you carry it back home, and you're so happy that you found it, that you throw a party for all your friends and neighbors. But then Jesus gets right to the point. They had been criticizing him for welcoming people who were not acceptable in their religious and social system. But Jesus says, listen, God rejoices more over one, just one sinner who was lost, but then turns around and comes back home. More than all of the rest of the people who didn't need to repent. So, what does this parable show us about what God is like? To me, the biggest message is this. God always, always goes to find the lost ones, the wandering ones, the ones in danger, the ones separated from the flock, trying to find their way. Where the people criticizing Jesus thought that Jesus was staining himself by welcoming the unrighteous to be near him and eat with him and learn from him, Jesus let them know that he was actually following the Father's lead, welcoming the ones who were marginalized and outcast and hated and inviting them to be with him. What is it like to be lost like a sheep separated from its flock? Have you ever been lost? Ever been wandering around trying to find your way? either like literally or spiritually or emotionally. I remember one time I was five years old and I got lost at a zoo. And I was mostly a pretty independent kid, but in that moment when I realized I had no idea where my family was and where my mom was, I just started crying. <laughs> like, I, and there I am, a five-year-old sobbing child. Honestly, my mom was just right around a corner. <laughs> She had six other children she was keeping track of, and I was the oldest, so she figured I was okay, but I was scared. I was lost for a minute. Like, I'm pretty sure that none of us are shepherds by trade. If you are, yes, you go. <laughs> I'm also, this I am 100% sure of, none of us are sheep. <laughs> Per se, per se. <laughs> but I think that we've all been lost at one point or another in our lives, or felt lost, probably lots of different times, and in different areas of our lives. What does it feel like when you're lost? Feels scary? feels dangerous, um, lonely, hopeless. The feeling that, that, that feeling that I get when I imagine being lost is like just trying to keep the panic at bay, you know, Ch trying to keep a cool head, but it's scary. Jesus always goes to rescue the lost one. And so this morning, I ask you, church family, who, who are the lost sheep in our world at this time in history, yeah. There you go. Yeah. in our nation, yeah. 
in our lives. You know, I must have seen this cartoon like 30 times posted on the internet in the past week and a half. And uh, not going to put it on the screen right now because of licensing laws. But if you Google All Sheep Matter, you will find it. It's a line drawing showing a big flock of sheep safe inside a fence. And Jesus is outside that fence and he's holding his shepherd's staff and he's walking away from the flock toward a cliff where one sheep is clinging by a fingernail, almost falling down the cliff. And the flock of sheep safe inside the wall are all holding signs that say, all sheep matter. Which honestly is not disputed, that's true, but, but this sheep over here is in danger. And Jesus is going to help that one. My friends, black lives matter. Jesus always goes to be with and rescue the ones that are hurting, that are in danger, who are cast out. Jesus is always found present with the other with the one who is different from us. Whether, whether they're aware of his presence or not, he's always there. But just like God left heaven in the person of Christ and joined with humanity, crossing over the, the unfathomable divide between divinity and humanity, and inviting us all to partake of his life, and thus be joined with God in the same way, in the same way, Jesus invites us to also go to the other, crossing over whatever divide we find, being his hands and his feet, lifting our brothers and sisters, loving and seeing and honoring our neighbor just as we do ourselves. Are we good at it? No. <laughs> God help us. We can only do it by his spirit. We can only do it because Jesus showed us how. See, the Pharisees in Jesus' time thought that the tax collectors and notorious sinners were lost and it wasn't worth it to reach out to them in their eyes. Their purity laws kept them from doing that. But I would submit that in God's eyes, the Pharisees were also lost. They had lost their way yeah. and gotten caught in the rules yes. labyrinth yes. that they had made with their own hands. Yes. And so they couldn't find God's mercy and love anymore unless they were rescued. The reality is that all of us are lost. Yes. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each of us have turned to our own ways. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquities of us all. Jesus always goes to find the ones who are separated, who are hurt and injured, who are in trouble, who are in need of help. Jesus is with the ones who need help. And that's all of us in different ways. We're all in need of help. I'm in need of help. And Jesus comes to find us. He always comes right to where we are. 
but isn't that, isn't that even just the human perspective that he comes, that he has to come and find us because I think really he, he was always right by our side and we just didn't see him and so we needed help because we didn't know he was there. So he breaks into our reality and we find ourselves found by him right in our pit, right in our desperate need. He's suddenly there. He, he finds us out. He opens our eyes to his solidarity with us. I do believe that we're in a time of apocalypse right now. And I don't mean it's the end of the world. Uh, as, well, maybe it is as we know it, right? But apocalypse, uh, I've been learning in these past few months. It means a time of revealing, a time of unveiling and uncovering time of blindness being changed into seeing. A time of seeing things for how they truly are. Will we allow God to give us the gift of repentance in this time? Repentance means turning around, allowing for change in our, our minds and our hearts and our lives. It, it, it literally means going a different way. We're all lost. We've all gone astray. And yet in Christ, God is constantly, always, always offering us an opportunity to be found, to be brought back home to him, home to his love. This is not only a moment for each of us as individuals. I believe that it's a moment for us as a nation and a society as well. This is truly an apocalyptic moment in history. A time of revealing and uncovering. And God help us. May we allow the shepherd to find us now. To bring us home to himself. When he was finishing up the parable, Jesus said to the Pharisees, he said, I tell you that in the same way, there will be more rejoicing in heaven over one sinner who repents than over 99 righteous persons who did not need to repent. This is the good news of the gospel. Heaven rejoices when we allow ourselves to be found, found out, changed when we turn around and go a different way back toward our shepherd's love and you know don't be don't be thrown off by the word repent it just means to open ourselves to god and to let god change us it starts with the heart and mind letting the way we think and see be changed and then it spreads to our actions and the way we live. When we let God change us, heaven rejoices. But when we're under the delusion that we don't need to change because we're already perfect, well, that's when a time of unveiling is a gift to shake us out of our comfortable righteousness and show us the reality that we are lost, but for our shepherd. God is always ready to find us and save us. So let's take a moment right now. Where are you this morning? Where are you in your heart? <coughs> in your spirit, in your mind, in your body? Where do you need the Good Shepherd to come to your rescue?
You know, when the shepherd finds the lost sheep, what does he do with it? He puts it on his shoulders. He picks it up. And he puts it on his shoulders. And he carries it back home. Friends, that's what repentance is. It's letting God pick us up. So, I don't know about you, but I could use that for my shepherd right now. The weary, the broken, the grieving, the hurting, the weak, that's all of us. That's all of us when we're willing to admit it. And Jesus is telling us that he's promising us that he will pick us up and put us on his shoulders and carry us home to his love. And I believe that he will bring us back to each other in his love. What a savior. Thank you, God. So just sit in that for just a minute now. I can see in my mind's eye just a shepherd Shepherds were just dudes. They were just worker guys in that society. They weren't really valued. And Jesus is like, I'm the shepherd. What shepherds knew how to do was take care of their sheep. So just imagine he's picking you up. He's putting you on his shoulders. He's bringing you home. Thank you, Lord. On the day that Jesus was betrayed, he took the cup and he took the bread. And he was having dinner with his disciples, some of whom were former tax collectors. And he held them up in front of them and he said, he held up the bread and he said, this is my body broken for you. And similarly, he held up the cup and he said, this is the blood of my covenant that I make with you. And he said, whenever you eat this bread, whenever you drink this cup, it's to remember me. And it's to proclaim who Jesus is until he comes back. So if, at, if you're at home and uh, you've got any kind of bread or anything, just get that ready. Get a cup of something ready. And we're going to partake in communion together, remembering our Savior. It was on my heart today that 
we would sing this song together. It's a very old song, it's beautiful. It talks about having the bread and the cup together on our knees and praising God together on our knees. And so what we'd like to do today is have you hold your communion and then we're gonna partake together at the very end of this song. When we come up, we will all be up here, we'll be on our knees, we'll end the song and then we will partake together. And we want us all to do that so that we can join in together and not just sing the song that we're doing it on our knees, but actually be together taking communion on our knees in this moment. So sing with us, get your things ready, and then we'll join you on our knees together. Let us pray
Thank you so much for joining us today. Just a holy, holy moment. God wants to change this world and he wants to use us to do it. It's going to require the repentance that Terry talked about, the turning the other way, the recognizing the full body of Christ, every color, every nation, here and now, on our knees before God, equal, crying out on behalf of the other, on behalf of one another, crying out that God's kingdom would manifest here on earth and that God would cause God's own every purpose to be fulfilled on earth just as it is in heaven. And it's going to require all of us on our knees, humble, going after the one, the one that people consider to be cast off. Let's do this together. Let's do this together, body. Let's do this together, church. Let's find the one. Let's find the one. God bless everybody. We love you all. And we'll see you again.